Chapter 12 of Ursula K. Le Guin's third Earthsea novel, The Farthest Shore, is entitled The Dry Land. And this has a particular significance, you could say, in not only the geography, but the metaphysics of the Earthsea universe. So it's not dry land like the land of the islands. This is, in fact, the land of the dead, or at least the majority of the dead, as we will find out a little bit later on. And it's an idea that we've already encountered previously in The Word of Unbinding, that, that very first Earthsea story, and in A Wizard of Earthsea, where Ged has to cross into the dry land to try to save a dying child, almost getting caught there in the process himself. And so the dry land is a dangerous place in many respects for the living. A mage can cross what's called the wall of stones and come back across still living. Anybody else is pretty much stuck on that side. And sometimes even mages might not be able to cross back. We find Thorian, the summoner, stuck there as they run into him in this story as well. And we learn a good bit more about the dry land in this story than we've ever learned in the previous Earthsea novels. So Ged and Labanan, Arin, right, cross over the wall of stones. This is the boundary point that the dead cannot cross of their own accord only by being summoned back into the world of the living as has happened in uh, the earlier chapters and has happened in other parts of the Earthsea saga. Um, they cross the wall of stones. This is them going into the land of the dead. This is going into a land in which there is no change. One of the really uh, graphic ways of depicting this is um, it was like a late twilight under clouds at the end of November, a dour, chill, dull air in which one could see, but not clearly and not far. Aaron knew the place, the moors and barrens of his hopeless dreams, but it seemed to him he was farther immensely farther than he'd ever been in dream. He could not make out anything distinctly, except he and his companions stood on the slope of the hill. Before them was the low wall of stones. They step over it, and he says, Overhead, where Aaron thought to see a heavy overcast of clouds, the sky was black, and there were stars. He looked at them, and it seemed as if his heart shrank small and cold within them. They were no stars he had ever seen. Unmoving, they shone, unwinking. They were those stars that do not rise or set, nor are they ever hidden by any cloud, nor does any sunrise dim them. Small and still, they shine on the dry land. So this is, you know, quite disconcerting. Right? He doesn't know where he is other than he's in the land of the dead. And what's really interesting about this account is we find out that the dead have a kind of what could we call it? Community? Something that imitates the life among the living? We have houses. We have other things like this. So he says, it seemed they walked down the hill slope a long way, but perhaps it was a short way. There was no passing of time here where, the wind, where no wind blew and the stars did not move. They came then into the streets of one of the cities that are there. And Aaron saw the houses with windows that are never lit and in certain doorways standing with quiet faces and empty hands, the dead. The marketplaces were all empty. There was no buying and selling there, no gaining and spending. Nothing was used. Nothing was made. Ged and Aaron went through the narrow streets alone, though a few times they saw a figure at the turning of, of another way, distant, hardly to be seen in the gloom. At the first of these, Aaron started and raised his sword to point. Ged shook his head and went on. Aaron saw that the figure was a woman who moved slowly, not fleeing from them. So this is you know, quite interesting. Why should there be houses? Why should there be towns? Why should there be marketplaces? We also find out, too, that these are kind of uh, unusual. You know, there's a lot of dead. Everyone who's ever died is there. But the land is vast. And so you can walk a long ways without encountering anybody unless you go into one of those towns. And there he says that the dead spirits are healed of pain and of life. It's 
interesting to think about that is life as something that you are healed of. And in a certain way, this prefigures what has happened to Cobb, right? So healed of pain, you know, the dead are not these horrifying figures that we see in movies, you know, where uh, we go down into their land and they're, they're skull faces or anything like that. No, they look like ordinary people. And the things that have been damaged uh, with them are, are not, uh, as, as we say, loathsome, not frightening, quiet were their faces, freed from anger and desire. There was in their shadowed eyes no hope. Now, he also tells us, rather, Aaron uh, realizes, the dead have no point to their existence. They just are. They are simply being. And there's really no direction. There's a couple ways of, uh, of looking at this. So he's, Aaron sees a mother and child who have died together, and they were in the dark land together. But the child did not run, nor did it cry, and the mother did not hold it or ever look at it. Those who had died for love passed each other in the streets. The potter's wheel was still, the loom empty, the stove cold, no voice ever saying. Nothing happens. None of these things that do in fact define us or characterize us. A potter remains a potter but makes no pots and doesn't seem to care about that. A little bit later, um, we find out that... uh, Here we go. It seemed to Aaron that in this timeless dusk there was in truth neither forward nor backward, neither east nor west, no way to go. Was there a way out? He thought how they'd come down the hill, always descending no matter how much they turned. And in the dark city, the streets went downward so that to return to the wall of stones, they need only climb. And at the hill's top, they would find it, but they did not turn. They came out onto the city. The country of the innumerable dead was empty. No tree or thorn or blade of grass grew in the stony earth under the unsetting stars. There was no horizon. There is nothing to, to actually look at. There's these mountains and there's high peaks weathered by no wind or rain, no snow to gleam in starlight. And what we find here is that Aaron goes through some emotional reactions passions really he begins with fear and then that transforms instead of fear then great pity rose up in Aaron and if fear underlay it it was not for himself but for all people for those in the land of the dead and those yet to die he sees that the mother and the child the lovers there's no connection between them anymore And so he feels pity for them. Then we encounter, you know, the coldness, weariness, and eventually Aaron just feels desolation in this land of the dead as a living person. They come eventually to the dry river. And at that point, they run into Cobb. And Cobb tells them, um, well, you're not going anywhere else from here, right? Ged says, we've come too far to turn back. And uh, a voice in the darkness says, you have come too far. Aaron answered it saying, only too far is far enough. You have come to the dry river, said the voice. You cannot go back to the wall of stones. You cannot go back to life. And Ged says, well, not that way. And then they have this encounter with, with Cobb. Cobb tells them that he has found immortality. He says, I have no fear. What should a dead man fear? And Ged, in his first response, says, well, you seem to be awfully afraid of death, aren't you? And uh, the uh, the person says, "Uh, I have, I live, my body lives, right? And he says, I can mend my body. I know secrets of healing and youth, no mere illusions. I alone among all mages found the way of immortality, which no no other ever found. And Ged says, well, maybe we weren't looking for it. And then here it's kind of interesting. He, Cobb, or whatever this, this thing is, is very cynical about it. He says, well, you didn't find it because you didn't look for it because you were afraid to. Or you did try to find it and you didn't. And I'm so much smarter than all of the rest of you. I did the, the thing that none of you could do. I'm the only one, is very solipsistic in the end. I'm the only one who truly lives. I'm the only one uh, who matters. He says, would you like to know how I did it? 
archmage. And he says, I was in Palm after you thought you'd humbled me. You taught me a lesson, but not the one you meant to teach. I said, I have seen death now. I will not accept it. Let stupid nature go its stupid course. I'm a man better than nature, above nature. I will not go that way. Notice what he says next. I will not cease to be myself. And now pause on this in a moment. The dead, are they still themselves? Well, this is a really great question. If we think about what it means to be you, there's a certain you that survives in this land of the dead, right? The potter, as we mentioned, remains a potter, but doesn't practice their art. The looms stand empty. The mother and the child don't relate to each other any longer as mother and child in any living way, only a frozen, dead way. Lovers pass each other on the streets. If that's part of what makes us us, something has been lost. And a little bit later, Ged is going to say to Cobb, uh, here we go, when, the bo- when my body dies, I will be here, but only in name, in name alone, in shadow. Do you not understand? Did you never understand you who called up so many shadows from the dead, who summoned all the hosts of the perished, even my Lord, Erith Akba, wisest of us all? Did you not understand that he, even he, is but a shadow and a name? His death did not diminish life, nor did it diminish him. He is there. They are not here. Here is nothing dust and shadows. There he is the earth and sunlight, the leaves of trees, the eagle's flight. He is alive, and all who ever died live. They are reborn and have no end, nor will there ever be an end. All save you. So now it's interesting because he's not saying, oh, well, Aerith Ekbo is reincarnated into a squirrel or this guy living over here or anything like that. He's just saying, no, there's, there's a difference here. The, the shadow, whatever this is, the, the name has survived in the land of the dead, and it has agency of a certain sort. It just never exercises that on its own. And then the life remains within the world of the living. And you, Cobb, have forgotten that and cannot master that. You can kill me and my body can die on the shore you know, of Celador. But even if you bind me here, you're only going to bind my, my shadow and my, my name. Coming back to Cobb, Cobb tells us, that what he did is, is go beyond the Pelnish lore, which was about summoning the dead, to create an even greater spell. And this is what has caused the crisis and catastrophe that is affecting Earth's. He says, I took the Pelnish lore again, but found only hints and smatterings of what I needed. So I rewove and remade it and made a spell, the greatest and the last. And Ged says, oh, in working that spell, you died. And Cobb says, yes, I died. I had the courage to die, to find what you cowards could never find, the way back from death. I opened the door that had been shut since the beginning of time, and now I come freely to this place and freely return to the world of the living. Alone of all men in all time, I am the Lord of the two lands. And the door I opened is open not only here, but in the minds of the living in the depths and unknown places of their being where we are all one in the darkness. They know it, the living know it, and they come to me. And the dead too must come to me, all of them, for I have not lost the majory of the living. They must climb over the wall of stones when I bid them, all the souls, the lords, the mages, the proud women, back and forth from life and death. All must come to me, the living and the dead, I who died and live. And then he says, well, where, do, where is it that you are? And he says, between the two worlds. So there's a between space, between life and death, that Cobb inhabits. He is the Lord of both worlds and of this in-between. Or at least this is how he presents himself to, to Ged, to the dragons, to all the dead, to all the living, as the king, as the immortal one. And Ged is going to reveal to him Things are not exactly as he thinks. Uh, not only does he tell him that, you know, the dead are simply these, these you know, shadows and, and names. He also says, a living body suffers pain, Cobb. A living body grows old. It dies. Death is the price we pay for our life and all life. And you're screwing up with this, right? And he asks him, what is your actual name? 
Cobb can't figure out what his own name is. He's lost that in the process. All he's got is Cobb, his old use name, and a bunch of titles, the immortal one, the king, you know, the lord. But these aren't actual names. He doesn't know himself any longer. He actually tells them, you're not real. You have no name. Only I exist. This solipsistic point of view again. And Ged says, you exist without name, without form. You cannot see the light of day. You cannot see the dark. You sold the green earth and suns and stars to save yourself. But you have no self. All that which you sold, that is yourself. You have given everything for nothing. All you're doing is trying to fill your emptiness. And the last thing that, he, that Cobb tries to say is his name is life. And Ged says, well, I would give you life if I could, but I can't. You're dead. I can give you death. And we can bring this to an end. You can be one of these inhabitants, as he's going to do shortly. Uh, after he heals the, the wound between these two worlds. So Cobb has drastically altered things and destroyed you know, so much in the process, including his own self. So a lot going on here in this discussion of the dead once we see our main characters crossing the wall of stones to go find what damage has been done and try to undo it within the dry land.